Welcome to the NIHR Dementia Researcher podcast, brought to you by DementiaResearcher.nihr.ac.uk, in association with Alzheimer's Research UK and Alzheimer's Society, supporting early career dementia researchers across the world. Hello, and thank you for tuning in to the Dementia Researcher podcast. Dementia Researcher has three main aims to encourage and support people to think about a career in dementia research across all areas of discovery, to create and share content and resources that support people to remain in the field and succeed, and finally, to facilitate collaborations, community, and sharing of knowledge. To deliver this, we work with some fantastic partners who have common values and aims, and Alzheimer's Research UK, or ARUK for short, is one such partner. In today's podcast, we'll be discussing the very newly launched ARUK ECR strategy and their wider program of work, which I feel sure will make a massive difference to early career scientists. I'm Adam Smith, and to help me discuss this topic, I'm joined by Dr. Rosa Sancho, Head of Research for ARUK, Dr. Jill Fowler, an ARUK Senior Research Fellow at the University of Edinburgh, and Professor Michael Coleman from the University of Cambridge. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. Hi Adam. Hi, Adam. Hello. Hi, Adam. Rosa, tell us about yourself and, and what you do at ARUK. As head of research, I oversee our funding programs and partnerships with other organizations. So that goes all the way from setting up grant schemes to receiving applications, reviewing them, contracting, um, catching up on progress and impact of the projects we're funding. But I also support the team at ARUK in identifying gaps and priorities in the field and developing strategies to address those, uh, implementing any new initiatives. And the, the ECR program we're, we're launching this week um, was part of, of that work. I've been at ARUK for 10 years. And before that, I was a postdoc and I did a PhD always in the field of neurodegeneration research. 10 years, that's a long time. And that's a big job as well. So you must have to have a real broad overview of everything that's going on across the landscape of dementia research. Yeah, it's been really enjoyable to tell you the truth. It's a, it's a field I feel quite passionate about and and there's so many great researchers working on it. It's it's just been really enjoyable all this time at AR UK to, to learn so much about the field. When I started out as a researcher, I was focused on um, molecular biology and, and now as head of research at AR UK, I just get a feel of other areas of research as well. So really interesting. Well, wonderful. Thank you for joining us. And it's about time we had you, we had you on the podcast. It feels like we, we should have had you on much sooner. And uh, next I'm going to come to Michael. Hello, Michael. Could um, you tell us about yourself and your work? Hi Adam, I'm a professor of neuroscience at, uh, in Cambridge, which uh, full disclosure there, I'm not an ECR, but uh, I was once and I, I remember, I think I remember a lot of what uh, I had to go through and I'm happy to help now in uh, addressing those issues. So my, my group, we're about 14 people, uh, we work on axon degeneration and, and synapse loss in a number of disease models, including dementia models. Um, and I've had several roles over the years connected with uh, Alzheimer's Research UK. They generously fund several projects in our group um, uh, over the years. I'm a former Grant Review Board member and also a former Cambridge Network coordinator. Um, I've done a number of crazy cycling events raising money for AR UK. Uh, and recently I chaired the working group uh, for developing an ECR strategy. Fantastic. Thank you. In fact, actually, this came up in a postdoc uh, podcast we had just before Christmas about um the potential benefits of of befriending a, a funder particularly a charity so making sure that you give something back to when you take out and things like that can definitely help build that relationship it sounds like you've uh, done well in achieving that over your career <laughs> yeah i think i think that's crucial actually one thing i i, I will come to later in the podcast i think is, is how important it is for scientists to feel respect the fact that we're all people as well and feeling part of a team like that is a huge motivator actually one thing i've always found is the alzheimer's Search uk conferences a, a huge motivating event which of course we we can make a plug for now actually while we're here aren't you it's happening in brighton in a couple of months time so details of that on the website do go take a look thank you for joining us today michael and um last but not least of course i'm going to come to dr jill fowler hello jill um could you introduce yourself and tell us about your career and how it developed 
So hi Adam, I'm, I'm currently an ARUK Senior Fellow, as you mentioned, at um, Edinburgh University. So my lab is based beside the Royal Infirmary at Edinburgh and uh, we research vascular dementia, uh, predominantly using animal models and also post-mortem tissue as well. So we're particularly interested in changes that occur to astrocytes and if we can target them as a treatment for vascular dementia. And so the early uh, years of my career weren't directly involved in dementia research as such, so they were in related but relevant fields of acute stroke and head injury research. Um, so I undertook my PhD at a, a lab in Glasgow, um, learning about preclinical models of stroke and how we can treat them. So the MRC Industrial Collaborative PhD was under the supervision of Mike O'Neill, so I learned, I spent some time at Eli Lilly learning about drug discovery as, as well. So having studied the acute response to these types of head injury and stroke um, in my undergraduate and postgraduate years, I was interested to learn that these both increase your risk of developing dementia and cognitive decline. And so from there, I wanted to learn more about the mechanisms involved. And this is um, where I started to read up a bit more and form some hypotheses. And I applied for a number of different junior research fellowships and I was uh, fortunate to have been awarded one from the Alzheimer's Society that involved developing a model of preclinical head injury. And from 2015 onwards, I've been um, awarded a senior fellowship from ARUK. And in this work, I'm interested in the very longer term changes that occur in the brain after a stroke and uh, how they may lead to cognitive decline in dementia. And that's a fascinating career to have been able to make that kind of swap over to into the pharmaceutical industry and then back to academia and and spreading across different um, funders as well and uh, bring you know being able to um, write those grant applications and, and bring that funding in it must be we should have you on the podcast again to talk about specifically on some of our careers topics well thank you very much Jill for joining us as well so for those of you listening outside of the UK, Alzheimer's Research UK is a leading UK charity. Last year, they spent £17 million on research, but they also go further through public engagement, communicating science, funding individuals, big projects and small, and have always put a real emphasis on helping young people and early career researchers. Rosa, why don't you tell us about your new ECR strategy and what's included and, and what are you doing that's new? The strategy came about as part of a wider strategy refresh that we've been working on at ARUK, and ECRs will be a key priority for us in the next five years. Um, as you said, we've always uh, funded ECRs and supported ECRs, but the need to refocus on ECRs came about as we saw the effect that the pandemic was having um, when an already relatively small pool of researchers found themselves even more vul vulnerable to job insecurity, to lack of funding because um, we had to pause our grant schemes during the pandemic and not being able to, to go into their labs and their clinics to do the, the work that they needed to do and that they enjoyed doing. We also ran a survey at the time, um, which told us that about a third of researchers were considering leaving research altogether because of the difficulties they were experiencing. So it became uh, more important than ever for us to focus our attention on early career researchers specifically. Obviously as a charity, in order to achieve our vision, we need to have a really strong and skilled workforce to help us to achieve um, the breakthroughs we want to achieve. So we reviewed what we were doing and we looked on how to improve it. Our plan, um, uh, we, we launched these, um, some new initiatives and we plan to, to keep launching some new initiatives throughout this year and to have an online portal that researchers can access for information. We already, uh, we've always had a, a program that was working really well, so we will continue to do all of those things that people might already be aware of. So, for example, uh, grant schemes like fellowships and PhD scholarships will continue to exist. We'll also continue to hold networking and training events like the Early Career Day at the, the conference, which is on the 28th of February this year. Uh, we'll also continue to host um our funded ECRs in our office for, for networking and training. 
will continue to have prizes and awards like the David Haig Awards, and we'll continue to invite ECRs to come to our grant review board meetings as observers. What's new then uh, is that with the help of an ECR working group, we, we added some more elements that were really uh, gaps and that were lacking in, in our program. We will, um, uh, we launched a new grant scheme called the Bridge Funding Scheme uh, to help uh, retain ECRs in the field. We'll also launch uh, a mentoring program and uh, we will enhance the sorts of training and event events that we offer. So for example, leadership and management training. And in general, we will try to increase our interaction with ECRs, listen what their, what their needs are, and also offer them more opportunities to work with us because AR UK is not just about funding. We also do a lot of public engagement, fundraising, uh, policy work, and those are skills that can, can benefit some ECRs as well. That's brilliant. I'm going to pick up on some of those particular, particularly those new things uh, in a little while. Uh, for now, I, I think one of the pieces of feedback we've heard, uh, particularly in the postdoc um, podcast we did before Christmas, was that we ended up with this, I mean, we already had a bottleneck with postdoc researchers, right, where there were lots of PhDs and then fewer postdoc positions, and it's a funnel that gets smaller and smaller. But then the pandemic just made that worse, because of course, having a year without funding meant that there were twice as many people applying for positions the following year. Uh, how do you decide how many positions you fund each year is this something that's decided according to income or is it a fixed number is this is that something that's looked at, at part of the strategy um yes it's been looked at we normally it's a balance between income and um the quality of applications that come in across all our grant schemes so not just the career development ones but also major projects for example or pilots what we've decided to do from now on is to prioritize early career researchers. So actually, obviously it will always depend on the income of the charity and what we can allocate to, to research anyway, but we will be um, restricting some funding for early career researchers in the knowledge that we might have some major projects that come through that are of higher quality, but we might prioritize early career researchers because um, they are really important for us to build capacity in the field. Yeah, I can I can see that, and I know I know what you mean about quality. I was I've been working with the NHR on various things, and some of their schemes they just they just don't get enough applications even to match the funding available. So don't, anybody who's listening, never and this came up in our podcast last time as well with uh, Mike Daniels is don't be you know deterred from applying if you think that uh, you're not eligible because actually sometimes the grants are just undersubscribed although I'm not sure if it's always the case with the postdoc ones perhaps so what are the overall aims for the strategy and how, how will you know if it's working so we had four overall aims one was to sustain the workforce that we currently have and to try to enhance capacity in key areas of need that we might identify in the next few years as priorities and an example of that, for example, is clinical research. We find that there's a lack of capacity uh, in that area, and we may put more investment in there to, to, to build um, more career pathways in that area. Second goal was to, to make sure that the workforce is diverse and, and highly skilled. Third goal was to increase collaboration uh, across disciplines. And the fourth goal was to strengthen engagement of EC between ECRs and ARUK programs, um, as I said, beyond funding, also public engagement and policy work. Um, we, in order to see whether we're achieving these aims, obviously it will depend a lot on individual initiatives and activities, but we'll try to keep an eye on um, how we are helping people to stay in the field, uh, keeping an eye on whether uh, ECRs are progressing to academic and industry posts, that they're able to secure funding from us or from other funders, um, and that we're um, 
increasing the, the opportunities we offer for training, in particular for people from groups that are underrepresented at senior academic levels. Um, we also hope that researchers feel more prepared to face leadership and management challenges as they become group leaders. Um, and, but we'll mostly try and seek as much feedback as we can from all of these initiatives and see if they're working, if they're benefiting uh, early career researchers, and if there's any opportunities they spot that we can improve. That's good. And of course, this year in the UK, we are expecting a new um, uh, dementia strategy from the from the government as well. So uh, I think this coming out of this time will also be interesting to see if any of the, the same things are picked up in in their strategy. I know the NIHR for a long time has struggled to encourage clinical uh, staff to to particularly working in dementia from from nurses and physiotherapists and speech and language therapists and people you know working in allied health professions to consider dementia research. In fact, we've we've done podcasts on this. We've we we picked it up it up we picked it up in our um, careers week. Uh, last year to try and encourage more clinical people to consider how they can come to come to research and bring their skills to that so if, if anything ARUK can do in help in that field I think will be massively appreciated and open up those doors to those NIHR to bring more of that NIHR money into dementia as well so I should add for anybody listening outside the UK NIHR is the National Institute of Health Research and if it's kind of our version of the NIH if you're in the U.S. Okay, Michael and Jill, I'm going to come to you first of all, Michael. What what role have you played in this strategies development? So yes, my role has been to chair the, uh, so far has been to chair the ECR working group. And I think as far back as I can remember in my career, I've always wanted to improve the research experience of those who came came next to leave that research culture in a better place i remember even back as a postdoc uh, writing out all the laboratory protocols for the next group of phd students who would be starting so that they could make a quick start on their experiments and recently uh, my research group and and uh, have been uh, developing a whole series of blog posts that are on our uh, laboratory website about things like uh, dealing with global crises, uh, things like dealing with paper rejections, and there's one in the pipeline now for uh, dealing with a grant rejection and all this sort of motivational hit that comes with that. So I was delighted when Rosa and AOUK asked me to uh, chair this uh, working group, and um, they've also now asked me to directly contribute to uh, the mentoring of a group of ECRs, which I think will be a great opportunity to pass on a lot of what I've learned, um, but also to coach them to support one another uh, to come up with their own solutions. Because from their perspective as ECRs it, and, and different uh, family and, and um, research backgrounds, it may, they may be different from those that I came up with a lot during my career. Um, and I've long believed that scientists don't do nearly enough to work as a group to support one another like that. So it's a great opportunity uh, to change that culture. And I think AIK is doing exactly the right thing um, in developing that strategy, because that is going to be one thing that really maximizes the use, uh, optimizes the use of the funding that they put into their research. And not only will that support the ECRs uh, themselves in developing the, their own uh, research and research management of their groups, the, the people in their groups, um, but it will also leave uh, pass on a culture to their own P uh, PhD students and postdocs as they go on into the future of their career. So it's a great way to really change the direction for good. And I, I completely agree. I mean, that's that's wonderful. And it just, I mean, I think we are already seeing that culture change. I think some of that that institutional rivalry, some of that secret, you know, a lab rivalry and um, secrecy that kind of was there a few years ago, it does feel like those walls are breaking down slightly and the, this to create a community that collaborates and realizing that that's where the the quickest wins will come from. Thank yeah, you. There's, uh, there's far too much of people sitting in their offices or their um, uh, corners of the lab, you know, suffering in silence about exactly the same problems. In each case, instead of comparing notes and being able to admit a little bit of vulnerability and 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 share what the solutions are, I think we could all be a lot better off with that different kind of culture. I 
Completely agree. And that's one of the things that in the, every time we run surveys ourselves or try to get feedback on dementia research, some of the positives have been how having um, early career researchers talk about their work and their experiences have really help everybody else. Thank you, Michael. And Jill, what about you? You've, you've been involved in this as well. I, I, were you on the group that Michael's chaired? Yes, indeed. So I, Rosa also asked me to take part in the working group um, where we spent quite some time discussing the issues faced by early career researchers. And we tried to think through and prioritise strategies that would help. So the working group itself was 12 early career um, and recently tenured researchers, including myself, in addition to Rosa and others from ARUK. And we were chaired by Michael. And I guess the first meeting we focused on trying to identify what the challenges were and reflect on our own personal experiences. And then we started to identify some strategies that could help. And following on from this, I met with our ARUK Scotland early career researcher reps who were Mike Daniels, Josie Fullerton and Fiona McLean. I had a chat with them and I additionally sent round a survey to ARUK Scotland Network uh, members just to get some of their opinions about the strategies that researchers felt should be a priority and also as a mechanism for researchers to share any further concerns that they've had during the pandemic. And this, I think, uh, helped us form a useful basis to help uh, shape the strategy. But one thing I would like to say was that a number of people got back to me to say that ARUK have always gone above and beyond in terms of their support for ECRs. So this new additional strategy and initiatives uh, are really helpful and you know they'll really help um, researchers at this much needed time. So I'm going to go off piece a little bit here because I'd originally planned to, to go and ask Michael what the challenges are, but you've just mentioned that you were directly asking those uh, ECRs in Scotland there what they came up with. So I'm going to jump between you both. But Jill, what? so tell me what are the kind of top two things that those those people in Scotland pointed out. So I guess, you know, even prior to the pandemic, it's always been an issue in terms of the short term nature of contracts. Um, so employed as a postdoc on a grant or in a fellowship usually only lasts three to two to four years, maybe. So it's always sort of fairly pressurised in terms of trying to get to the next step and so on. And the pandemic has obviously worsened this issue as well. It's meant that there are as Rosa mentioned, there have been less funding opportunities available. So I guess this is where the new bridge funding scheme will be so important moving forward because we don't want to lose researchers that have spent such a long time being highly trained in, in specialised fields with, you know, technical skills, analytical skills. We had a whole theme of this. I've mentioned this so many times, I'm going to show up mentioning. They, it was a big theme before Christmas, this kind of postdoc world of, two years, one year, two years, one year, uh, and without being able to set down roots in any one place, that lack of certainty when you're looking to get a mortgage or just have a life. So it's great that that's, that's something that came up. And we're going to talk about the bridge funding, I think, in a, in a little while. Michael, what, what do you pick up on as being some of the, the real challenges that you, you need to address? Yeah, I think a, a problem that a lot of ECRs face uh, is managing people. Um, ECRs are selected to move on, progress in their academic uh, research careers because of the ability to manage experiments. And a very few lucky and very talented individuals are also very good uh, innately at managing people, but the vast majority, and cer um, certainly me included, had to learn, have to learn uh, how to do that and how to take on those responsibilities of being responsible for someone's career, who's, you know, the people you manage, maybe themselves, uh, trying to think about um, family and building a home and as, et cetera, as you, as you mentioned, and they are also under stress. So handling the stress that goes around a group as it, as everybody brings their own issues into work, it's a lot to uh, deal with and it, it's it's and of course as you say at the time you may have your own um uh trying to build your own family and home life um 
So it really is also with even within the workplace, it's balancing those conflicting demands of many people at that stage are still doing experiments themselves, uh, which have unpredictable timing. Experiments almost always take longer than you think. Uh, supervising others, uh, uh, grant applications, uh, conference travel, whatever that was, uh, but it takes a lot of time. It's a great, exciting event, uh, but uh, it does take time and it needs fitting in. I think also dealing with the motivational hit of things like grant rejections, paper rejections, most ECRs have reached that point because they're high achievers. Uh, they're not used to having failure or much failure in their life. Um, they may have had some failed experiments when, when they have been at the bench. Everybody has, of course. But the, the notion of having a, a written grant application that then is judged by others uh, that then comes back to you as, as a... Um, uh, as a human judgment is where the factors well outside of control really does come as a shock, but is a, as, this is the best uh, um, style that can be managed. It's the best kind of the uh, least worst system. Uh, and we all have to accept that at some point and live with it and do our best through it. And as we say, this all comes at a challenging life stage uh, uh, yourselves. Um, so it's vital to have that good mentorship and a peer support network. Absolutely. Uh, and I mean, no arguments here on any of those points at all. I mean, they, these are all common themes that have come up and things we've tried to address ourselves, particularly around resilience and, and you know, putting your best foot forward with the grant applications and then dealing with the fallout of those. But even then, even if you get the grant, how do you plan the budget and translate that into research and meet the demands of funders and institutions? It's it's. It's challenging, right? But yeah, ab absolutely. It's very challenging. <laughs> but also, if, if you can do it, it's also very rewarding. You know, you learn so much. Uh, I, I found, actually, uh, you're, the, the point where you finish your PhD is the most narrow your skill set will ever be uh, if you stay on in academic research. Because immediately, you're supervising others. You're learning about people. You're starting to learn about budgets. You're starting to learn about... Uh, almost you could call it the kind of marketing, the going out and selling uh, your research, not um, selling in a greasy car salesman type of way, but, you know, just communicating what you found and why it's important. Uh, th these are really uh, crucial uh, skills that every ECR has got to develop. That's wonderful. And, and having the opportunity to kind of put these, present these, these issues to Alzheimer's Research UK and then have a funder that's willing to listen, find practical, affordable, deliverable solutions to, to help people, I think is, is wonderful and uh, great that we've we've got this strategy. Let's let's come back. Uh, we've mentioned the pandemic a couple of times. Are there any uh, I, I think are there anything else that's that that's put a real spotlight on, do you think, beyond the the shortage of funding what else has that brought up jill uh, that, you, that you've seen in in your in in your community in my experience um so a lot of my work involves transgenic mouse colonies and so when the labs closed down that side that experimental side became affected and then when the labs reopened we had to build up our colonies again and so for example, in my own experience, I was trying to generate some pilot data for a grant resubmission, and that really took a hit in terms of how long it was. I was able to achieve that. Um, I'm sure I speak for anyone else who's a parent as well that, you know, for, for me, there were new challenges in trying to combine um, working with homeschooling as well. So particularly in the early days of homeschool, when it was quite an unexpected situation and there was less guidance from the school. So we were essentially trying to make up the curriculum for our kids. Um, I guess like everyone else, I just tried my best and we had some good days and some bad days. Um, and overall, I still managed to achieve a few things at work because it did give us a, a bit of space away from day-to-day -day experiments to do a bit of reading and to write some papers, to think about new proposals. Um, and I guess for me, it was a challenging time when I returned to the lab. Um, so the lab was, had opened again, and then we had a new um, lockdown and homeschooling period from January 2021 onwards. So for me, that was more of a challenge to try and supervise students and experiments in the lab and technicians and so on, but back to homeschooling as well. And I guess, the nicer thing was that the homeschooling at that point was a bit better organized by the school. So we had, um, you know, clearly well-defined um, sort of exercises for the kids to work through and so on. 
And I think that's been one of the challenges in the UK, particularly, hasn't it? Is this this because the situation's been constantly evolving? You we go from what you think is one reality to the next very quickly, where you can transition from being half open, half closed, to being fully closed, and that doesn't help when when you're the planning, building up those mouse colonies and planning those experiments isn't something that happens a um, week in advance or a month in advance. It's six months in advance, and um, I guess if we'd just known that we weren't going to do anything like that for a year, it would have been easier to plan but it, and being able to remain dynamic and then keep the funding there available because all that time that those experiments aren't happening, you're burning through your salary budget. Um, and, and, and we, of course, we didn't have the same access to furlough in, uh, certainly in the early days in the, in the same way. Thank you, Jill. Um, Rosa, let's talk a little bit more about that mentoring program that's been mentioned, um, because the importance of networks and mentors has come through clearly in other shows and in the survey work we've done with iStart as well. So how did this come about? So mentoring was identified as a key need for early career researchers and complete credit to UCL and the Scotland Network Centres. They went ahead um, identified these needs amongst themselves and set up uh, a mentoring scheme pilot between the two network centers. So um, they matched mentors and mentees from the opposite center and got really great feedback from everyone at the end of it. And what I think worked really well in this pilot was that a lot of time and thought was put towards the pairing of mentors and mentees. So the pairing was done by members of the network centers themselves, meaning that people's specific challenges and their areas of work were taken in consideration. Um, and it was just very effective. So what we're doing is bringing that in-house to be managed by Alzheimer's Research UK headquarters, purely because uh, administratively it's easier for us to manage it than the network centers themselves, because we'll expand it to the whole of the UK across all of our network centers. But we hope to keep uh, the same structure and methods that UCL and Scotland used. So we'll have a panel of researchers from all centers that can help us do uh, pairing of mentors and mentees. And we'll also provide additional training ahead of the mentoring starting to make sure that mentors and mentees feel quite confident on their roles. So mentor, potential mentors and mentees can go to our website uh, and fill out a very simple application form, a sort of expression of interest they'd like to mentor or they'd like to, to be mentored. And then uh, in a couple of months, uh, we'll work with a panel to, to provide that pairing and that training ahead of the mentoring starting. Alongside this, we're also working on another mentoring program, but looking at group mentoring instead of one-to-one, -one, where we have several ECRs working together with a single mentor, which is a slightly different model, but it combines mentorship and peer support. We're looking to launch that in a few months, and we're in the process of recruiting mentors. One, one of them will be Michael, which we're really pleased about. So hopefully there will be you know, a couple of programs there that will fill this gap uh, and will reassess in a year's time. Well, that's that's really cool. And, and an opportunity there, I guess, to also look at the work that they did um, with the NIHR funding program with the writing group support, which has that kind so, of same see it, feel to it. It's based on that. It's exactly based on that. Uh, Professor Katie Featherstone led that pilot for NIHR, which was really successful and we were really interested to, to hear about. And so we've been working with um, Professor Featherstone to replicate that um, for oh, AR UK. That's great, because that was our office that set those up as well. <laughs> oh, not, no, we're not taking credit. Katie deserves all the credit for the success of those. Um, that's, that's, that's really great. I mean, mentoring comes through strongly every time. Everybody who has successfully 
built those not even necessarily one mentor but having different mentors for different things at different career stages um uh, you know they they rave about that relationship and how helpful that's been and i i I, I slightly know about this because, of course, I was involved in the Scotland work myself. But um, Jill, is you were involved in the pilot. I, I'm guessing the pilot was successful, which is um, which is why this is now being adopted nationally. Yes. So we at the at the end of the pilot, um, a survey was sent out to everyone involved, and I think 100% of mentees and mentors said they were either satisfied or very satisfied with how it had gone. So it had overall been really successful. Um, I, I mean, as Rosa mentioned, it was kind of, it was driven forward by the early career uh, network. It was an idea of theirs and, and overseen by Fiona Kerr, our ARUK Scotland network coordinator. Um, so it ran, th this pilot ran for six months um, last year. And I guess s some of the key aims were to, help boost the confidence of the mentees to help them see their abilities. And also a key sort of goal of the whole thing was to try and boost collaborations between Scotland um, and UCL as well. So for example, to try and uh, build up, um, you know, networks where we can invite people from UCL to give talks in Scotland and so on, to offer some unbiased guidance and support as well, which is sometimes a bit easier when you have someone out with of your institution and away from the internal politics. Uh, and, you know, obviously to oversee, to help assist and direct their career development within dementia research, which as we've um, discussed is so important in the current climate and just to share experience and knowledge in general. And so I took part in this scheme as a mentor as well, which is sort of my first um, time as a mentor role sort of evolving from a mentee to a mentor and I was paired with a researcher from UCL so I find this to be hugely rewarding I, I met with my mentee once a month via zoom and we often chatted for over an hour so hopefully I can continue this relationship and was of some help and I think rolling it out in a national way will be really helpful to the dementia community I, I, can I say I've had the same so I, I, I have a mentee from that scheme as well who's in Scotland and we meet mm -hmm. every month and mm -hmm. it's I, I can completely back up everything you said it's been really uh, great and uh, I, I like to think I've been able to help but also as well I've definitely learned something from the mentee as well. Absolutely I think it's a learning experience from both sides as well isn't it? Mm -hmm. It is. Um Brilliant. So that's the mentoring scheme. So the forms you mentioned are on the website now for mentors and mentees to apply. Do mentees have to be part of the ARUK, one of the local, one of the networks across the country? Yes, they uh, need to be members of the network centres. And if they're not, they, they can um, uh, register in it through our website as well or by contacting their local coordinator. And uh, so... Just because I, I'm, I'm conscious that not all of our listeners are lab-based researchers, for example. So the, the local networks, are they primarily lab-based and clinical researchers? Is there are many, say, psychologists or care researchers or people working in qualitative research. I would say they're probably following the biomedical spectrum. So they'll be lab-based or, or clinicians involved in dementia research because that's um, the the primary remit of Alzheimer's Research UK. Um, so we will probably cater more towards the, the biomedical scientists. Um, Michael, I don't know your experience of the Cambridge Network, but I would say there's probably very few uh, other health professionals as members. Yes, I think we had a few. And I think uh, the other really important thing to say here, I think, is that you don't have, to, uh, my understanding is you don't have to be an AOUK funded no. uh, researcher to take part. You just don't need to be doing some kind of dementia relevant research and have a, a viewpoint on that and be able to contribute something and gain from it. So, yeah. Okay, so biomedical clinical researchers, not funded necessarily funded by AOK, but must be a member of the network, the network center, which of course is also free to, to yeah. join. You can do that through the website. So if you're not already a member, you can join through the website and then go on to fill in the mentoring application form. And of course, anybody who's out there who, who you know wants to support this work it'd be great if you'd come forward as a as a mentor as well. And I, I really would say don't underestimate 
the you know your abilities to help somebody although of course we know that there are always challenges on time but paying it forward i think is a is a good idea so do come forward um and that's on the aoka website let's let's move on to a bridge funding and funding generally so when, when are you going to be your funding calls this year rosa do you know when they're already going to be yeah, so we'll have a deadline for junior and clinical fellowships on the 6th of July, and then we'll have deadlines for pilot projects and PhD scholarships later in the autumn. Uh, we launched this new scheme, which is the ECR Bridge Fund Scheme, and the deadline for that is uh, 29th of April. And we hope that that has quite a short turnaround to be reviewed by our grant review boards in um, latest by mid-June. And that, um, that will be grants of up to £30,000. And the aim of the scheme is really to enable the retention of early career researchers in dementia research. So we'll be trying to address particular pinch points in the career paths of researchers. Um, ECRs can use these to cover funding gaps or to complete key pieces of work for a publication, for example. So they'll need to justify um, how this bridge fund will help them stay in dementia research, develop their careers in dementia research, preferably by showing that they will be able to obtain or they are aiming to obtain further longer term funding uh, after the bridge fund. And is that something that the supervisor applies for or the individual? Uh, we would encourage the ECRs themselves to be the lead applicants. They can request their own salary uh, using this grant scheme, so they should be able to be the lead applicants. Um, but it could also be a supervisor if that's not possible. I think different institutions have different guidelines on, on this, um, who can lead an application. So this is clearly much needed funding, whereas particularly with the competitions being so stiff for postdocs and immediately, uh, I assume this would be open to people who've just finished their PhD as well, who are yes. doing their publications and haven't yet found their first postdoc position. Yeah, well, where there's a um a gap in funding, they'll be eligible to do this. We'll need to prioritize those people who have um, who have quite concrete plans to secure further funding, so something to bridge to, um, but obviously open to any early career researcher at any stage of their careers. Wonderful. So the initial round of this would be from April, and then it'll be reviewed, I guess. Yes, we will um see how it goes and we'll also keep in touch with the people who received this bridge funding see how successful uh, the scheme was whether they were able to bridge to whatever they wanted to bridge uh, and then develop the scheme from there great well thank you for for sharing that and for for coming up with the scheme it's i think that's going to help so many people right now and um, we'll see how that develops what about the fellowships you mentioned that you're going to be offering some management and leadership training is this specifically targeted at fellows you fund or is this another a bit like the mentoring scheme that's open to everyone um the fellowship schemes themselves won't be changing for now but we will be encouraging applicants to include um, costs for training to be incorporated in the budget um, and these can be for leadership and management training, which we specifically encourage because we think they're, they're lacking um, at universities or, or in other grant schemes, but also for any technical or research skills training that people think might, might identify as key. Um, so these will be for, for ARUK fellows. Obviously, for those current ARUK fellows who probably didn't include any budget in their grants for this sort of training and whose universities do not offer this sort of training, we will be offering separate leadership and management courses. Um, as a pilot, we, we will be um, offering them the EMBO course, which is quite well renowned and it has received really good feedback in gaining those really important skills and we'll be doing this in partnership with the Creek Institute. So hopefully by allowing ARUK funded fellows to go to go through this sort of training we will um, be 
um, helping them develop those skills that are actually really important as they become group leaders and have their own people to manage and and their and their grants to manage. That's great. I can I can hear there are. I can hear the qualitative researchers out there doing their jogs and walking their dogs right now going, oh, why, why aren't, why aren't the funders doing the same thing for us in this space? I, I hope uh, anybody that funds qualitative research is, is inspired by ARUK's um, position on this, because I think that, that transition into leadership, moving to managing your own groups and management is, is really essential. And it it's, brilliant AI UK are doing this for that space but definitely any funders listening that fund qualitative research could need to take a take a leap and do the same thing for the, those people working in that area as well Michael you've been successful in finding funding you need what what would you what advice would you have for anybody who's going to be putting in an application for one of those AI UK calls yeah, so we've we've usually been successful in the end in getting the funding we need, uh, but it's been far from plain sailing. So uh, I think that the success rate differs between different grant bodies. That's, that's all different funding organisations that I've applied to. I'm, I'm including in that. Uh, the success rate does differ a little, but a, a sort of ballpark figure across different organisations might be 20 to 25 percent average success rate uh, for everybody. Um, maybe I've been a little bit higher than average but it's it's definitely below 50 percent uh for me and uh you know it's something we all live with and we still live with uh, also at, at, at more advanced career stages and it's something it's crucial to find a way of dealing with and it's also vitally important that a very uh um, good new trend is for people to be open about those rejections to actually post them on twitter or other social media and uh, encourage other um, scientists, in particular ECRs, that it's not just them that are suff suffering uh, in this way. And it's about having the persistence, the determination uh, to go back, have another look at your ideas, take on board any feedback that you do feel is valid and modify accordingly and have another go. And to stick with the ideas you really believe in, and you do get there in the end. You, uh, it's something you really have to uh, develop that kind of resilience, but also that ability to look hard at your own, uh, what you've uh, proposed, and say, how do I need to modify this? Um, and the other thing I think, from a ECR um, point of view, is always never to interpret a grant rejection as a sign that you can't do good science. Um, in the end, it's a human judgment. And I, th I think it was Daniel Kahneman that uh, had a great quote that I heard about that wherever there is human judgment, there is always noise and there's more of it than you think. The, the review board, the grant review boards do their best in a least worst system, uh, but there is inevitably, people are different. Every, every uh, reviewer, every grant review board member is different and they will all have slightly different opinions. And, and the use of a committee is to try and average that out and reduce the, the noise, but it's, you never get rid of it completely. One of the best things an ECR can do uh, for their uh, ability to develop a, a good grant application strategy uh, is to see a grant review board in action. So the ARUK has a wonderful scheme uh, for ECRs of being able to observe uh, the grant review board for a day uh, and to see how the Sometimes there's differences of opinion across the committee, and sometimes they um, um, uh, have to give a difficult feedback or make difficult decisions. And very, very often, the, the review committee is working uh, uh, under extreme pressure themselves. They all have their day jobs to do, and it's it's a it's a uh, a difficult task to be able to do that, make those decisions. So it's really important to see that and also to hear about what makes a good application. I, I think you did a, another recent podcast on exactly that topic, which was uh, really fantastic. So um, I, I very highly recommend that. We did. Um, our podcast from the 3rd of January had Mike Daniels reflecting on his experience uh, attending uh, one of the grant review boards, I think was looking at pilot grants uh, from last year. We've also got, I think, at least five pod uh, blogs on this topic as well from people who have reviewed um going back as far as 2018 i think uh, uh people who've reviewed that and some of the people who are going to be already approved to re review the next ones have already been in touch with us to say they'd like to write about their experiences so do have a look at our website um if you look uh, go to the top and search under uh, uh, grant writing you'll find lots of resources there uh, top tips from people blogs podcasts articles webinars and more that might help thank you michael um so rosa 
clearly AR UK can't fix all the problems that ECRs face. Um, do you think there are things that individual research in your in your review and talking to ECRs, are there some things that individual research institutions could be doing more from their side to help realize the aims of this strategy? Because you're at arm's length, right? You can give them money, you can encourage, but but you, you can't influence what happens day to day in the places that they work. What, what do institutions need to be doing better? You're right. We, we can't sort everything and else, but we, we do need to work collaboratively with universities because they're the ones who actually employ ECRs and they're the ones who provide the career structures for ECRs to progress. Uh, but universities do have their own challenges. Um, and it's difficult for me to answer that question because I ap appreciate those challenges. And I know some universities actually do really well in supporting their ECRs while others probably just don't have that capacity. What I would say is that the whole ecosystem, and that means universities, the government, um, a funder like us and researchers themselves need to work towards a fairer research culture. And that's not just down to universities, it's down to everyone working together, um, where ECRs are given opportunities to progress and to grow, that a wider variety of skills and output starts being recognized and valued more than it is now, and that we address inequalities in the career pathway, because we know there's a lot of inequality when it comes to senior positions in academia. And I think if we could address these, then ECRs would feel more nurtured and more supported in being able to develop the career they want to, to develop. So. Um, some of their challenges will probably disappear if research culture was improved. Uh, and this is something we should all work together towards. So you, you make a good point there about culture and, and changing that. Does EDI have a, a place in this strategy? Is it addressed? Yes, certainly. We at ARUK, we also have a separate EDI strategy, but actually they interlink, right? All of this is interlinked. And I think a lot of the um, structures and activities we're putting in place to improve um, diversity will have an effect on, on career pathways. And I can give you some specific examples around that. We're thinking about narrative CVs uh, to allow people to, um, to showcase a wider variety of skills and outputs that they have that go beyond their nature publication and that they were first authors rather than second authors. You know, we want to go further than that. We're also collecting data on EDI, which we never did before. So we get a really good understanding about the diversity in our field. We're thinking about things like anonymizing grant applications. Um, perhaps not possible for fellowships, but for other grants, because we really do see um, inequality, gender inequality when it comes to project grants. Um, so trying to understand the factors behind that and trying to address them will hopefully improve research culture, which will in turn improve um, career pathways for, for researchers. And yeah, I mean, addressing some of the, I mean, things like anonymizing to address that unconscious bias, I think is, is a good idea. Um, and of course, we know that there's lots of work going on, to, particularly to try and encourage more young people as well, to, um, um, uh, black scientists to to come forward and apply for those PhD programs, which they're just not doing in the numbers that we'd like to see. So anything I think AI UK that does through this strategy that helps address that, I think is wonderful. Thank you very much, Rosa. I think I'm going to throw out a couple of final questions because this we, we've been talking for ages now. Honestly, I think this will be a real help to early career researchers, dementia researchers all across the UK, and it's really welcome. So last couple of questions. Uh, Jill, what were the biggest challenge you faced yourself as an ECR and what enabled you to get through it? Well, I mean, as Michael mentioned earlier, it's often when you're an early career researcher is when you start to think about um, laying down roots and having a family as well. So I had two children during my Alzheimer's Society Fellowship. And I think it can be quite challenging to try and be the best parent you can be and also good at your job as well. Sometimes you can feel like you're not really doing particularly well in either role. Um, and I have had some challenging times when my 
my kids were younger particularly one of them had quite a few health problems and a number of hospital appointments and I think when your kids become sick you worry about them you're maybe losing sleep you're up in the night and the knock-on consequences of that can be that it's quite hard to keep on top of everything that your job demands and if you start to lose self-confidence that can impact on a number of different things so I think things that helped me through this were just having good colleagues good mentors um trying to form a better work-life balance myself I mean and, and just in more general terms reflecting on some of the other things we discussed it can be harder to you know as Michael mentioned you're maybe you're quite good at experiments but then you have all these other responsibilities as well in terms of managing budgets so you you've not necessarily come into this to learn accountancy but you suddenly have to balance all your 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 grant funding and make sure you have funding in place to do the experiments that you want to do and managing people as well so there's a lot, a lot of things to learn which is why it's great that we have this new these new strategies from ARUK but I, w- one last thing I, I guess to mention is it's not wholly as we've discussed not wholly the um, responsibility of ARUK and there is some responsibility of the institution to help with these things as well so for example at Edinburgh University they've sponsored me a place on the Aurora uh, female only leadership course which I've just started and I did one day on, on that yesterday morning and I'm finding that to be really helpful as well so and there should be things in place from institutions as well to help with these things. Thank you Jill and anybody who's interested in working out how to balance uh, a career in research and parenthood should go away and look at a uh, webinar we did a couple of months ago with um, uh, with Dr. Lavisha Sivanarasha uh, from uh, Card no Bristol Cardiff she's in Wales Bangor she's in Bangor and she did this wonderful webinar where she gave a very honest um, painted a very honest picture of what it was like raising a, a child whilst also doing lab research as well I think she's a, an Alzheimer's Society fellow so do go in a on our YouTube channel and have a look at that. M- Michael, I'm going to come to you for that very last question. So given your 25, 30 year old self looking back, what advice would you give to them? What do you wish you'd done differently? So actually this follows on perfectly from what Jill was just saying. And my biggest advice would be never forget that scientists are people uh, and we're people first. You know, we, we do, we're motivated to do research because of whatever um, uh, academic interest we may pick up uh, during the course of our education and, and, and very early career. But we want to use that uh, to help society, but also to support our own families and develop our own uh, um, um, uh, support network and so on. And we have all those same needs. We need to feel part of a team. We need to connect with other people. We need security. And to make, for example, a collaboration work, you have to have trust. And that trust is built on on those direct personal conne- connections. And that, again, has been one of the um, 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 problems of the pandemic is the inability to have those in-person meetings. Uh, we've got to get back to all of that. And at the end of the day, you know, to do good objective research, the research may be objective, uh, but you have to remember you're a human being, your team are human beings, and you have to stay motivated like everyone else. I think that's a really crucial thing to remember. Thank you, Michael. Good, very good points to finish on. So I'm, I'm just going to recap on the takeaway. So if you haven't already had a look, go onto the AIUK website where you'll find their new ECR strategy, which was launched just in the last few days. Um, and you can have a read through that. I think the key points here are clearly some of the big ticket items were the, the new mentoring scheme sounds wonderful, the bridge funding scheme, the extra training and support that's going to go into the to the fellowships as well. And and having this this new picture and look and we heard the grant scheme deadlines in there as well. Uh, and of course, the chance to go and review the the grant review boards and the conference coming up shortly as well, which I'm sure this is going to be discussed at your conference as well, isn't it, Rosa? Yes, it will, in particular at the Early Career Day, which is on the 28th of February. Uh, and the programme has been put with this, uh, this strategy in mind. And, and if anybody would like to apply to be on that mentoring scheme um, or um, be a mentor, um, I think that's probably going to be realistically UK only. Although maybe mentors could probably come from overseas if you're going to meet in Zoom. Um, 
so don't be put off actually if you're a if you're overseas and you'd like to be a mentor then don't let that put you off applying we that could be a great way of getting some experience of how how it is in the US or in other parts of Europe. Uh, so thank you very much to our guests, Dr. Jill Fowler, Dr. Rosa Sancho and Professor Michael Coleman. Along with uh, the show notes from today's podcast, you'll find a link to the AI UK strategy, their funding pages and all the various things and schemes we've discussed today. We have profiles on today's panelists as well on our website, including details of their Twitter accounts. So please take a look. Finally, Please remember to like, subscribe in whichever app you're listening in. And remember to subscribe to our weekly bulletin as well, which you'll get only through our website. And if you'd like to just join us to discuss your own research on the show, drop us a line and you'll find details on how to contact us in the show notes. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Brought to you by DementiaResearcher.nihr.ac.uk in association with Alzheimer's Research UK and Alzheimer's Society, supporting early career dementia researchers across the world.